if you want to be a successful fly angler, you've really got to learn how to fly fish with nymphs. It's not enough to just know how to put a nymph rig together. You actually need to understand all of those little details that make this a truly indispensable tool for any angler. On today's show, you're going to learn all of the VFC secrets for successfully fly fishing with nymphs. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled. I am your host, Spencer Durant, and if you're watching the video podcast, you'll notice I am not in my studio this week. No, I had I made the trek. I left Wyoming. I left the land of sagebrush and antelope and came all the way down to the land of Botox and Babes here in Utah, <laughs> and I am with our CVO, Alex Stoltz, our chief video officer, and we're we're just we're happy to be back together, man. Pumped. It's gonna be a this good time. It's gonna be a great one. We we're gonna have a lot of fun because we are chatting everything that you absolutely need to know about fly fishing with nymphs. That is today's episode. We are gonna cover everything that we could possibly think of about fishing with nymphs. Depth, flies, split shot, rigs, indicators, rods, you name it. We got a bunch of questions. We got pretty much every topic we could think of. We mm-hmm. threw it on a sheet and we're going to talk about it. So. We, we, we are going to give it the, the absolute uh, most that we can. So um, we'll see what we've got. And if you are brand new to fly fishing, don't worry about it because we're going to give you a solid base. So you might feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, but there's going to be enough here, I think, to help you all out. And then if you've been fly fishing for a while, don't worry. This is not going to be a lot of review because we are going to try and push you. We're not just talking about the basics of nymphing. We're, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit. We're actually going to go through a lot of the why. We talk about that here at VFC all the time. You've got to understand the why behind things. But then we're also going to talk about some of the different ways that you can be successful with nymphing. So we want to try and push you uh, to excel a little bit more in this arena. And hopefully push ourselves because yep. we love to learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always want to improve as anglers ourselves. And yep. so just even diving into this information, prepping for this this podcast, I learned a lot. So Yeah, I did awesome. too. So it's been a good time. Now, before we get started, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Uh, for those who are new to the fly fishing game, maybe this is you just picked up your fly flinger combo from here, us here at VFC, and you want to go out and fish, and you're like, I'm going to nymph. Well, what is nymphing, Alex? Why don't you walk us through that? So you have aquatic insects, which are the bugs that we're imitating as fly anglers. Those are our flies. They're imitating aquatic insects. They're the most common thing that we're imitating. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a life cycle. They, the baby bugs they grow up on the bottom of the river. And then when they start to grow up, they turn into emergers and they hatch. And so when you, the most iconic hatches that happen in fly fishing, it's those bugs going from the bottom of the river and then hatching into adults at the top. Yep. So nymphing is a a catch-all term for those bugs that are living at the bottom of the river. And so as anglers, we're picking flies and we're imitating those bugs at the bottom of the river, the nymphs. Yeah. So I think that covers it yeah. for us pretty well. So now that we all understand what we're talking about nymphing wise, we are just going to jump right into all of the content and we've got a lot. So you're definitely going to want to get comfortable. I've got my diet Coke right here because I would never be caught drinking Coke zero. It's a Coke zero cherry. Everyone. Mm-mm. <laughs> Devin, you're going to blur that out in the video for us, right? <laughs> he better. He knows what's good for him. Uh, I may or may not have purposely only put Coke Zero in the fridge. Yeah, I noticed that today when I got here. There was no Diet Coke for me. Sorry, so. I'm cheating, too. I think I got Mountain Dew Zero. Yeah. I need a little extra oomph today yeah. to, get, to get us through the nymphing. You, you needed oomph to get up for a <laughs> podcast with me? Nah, it's awesome. No. Okay. Well, I think we're going to be good. So uh, I think we kind of covered why nymphing is an important skill. Is there anything else you'd like to add about, you know, why... Well, you know, maybe we didn't. Let, let me back that up a little bit, to be be honest with you. So nymphing's an important skill, and we talk, and you'll hear me joke throughout the day today about, well, you got to, if it's not a dry fly, it doesn't count. And that's actually the family I grew up with. 
my my grandpa and my dad both they only ever fished dry flies so if it wasn't like i didn't even know a nymph existed until i think i was like 14 or 15 i didn't even know nymphs were a thing so uh i i was very much raised in that if it's not a dry fly it doesn't count sort of family <laughs> and it's great because i'm morally superior to everybody because i catch most of my fish <laughs> on dry flies but uh <laughs> for those of you who who uh you know are just getting into this why is it such an important skill why why do you need to know how to nymph if you're going to be a good angler what is it that makes it so imperative i think there are times when fish just aren't coming to the surface Mm -hmm. you know like middle of the winter there's no bugs out you might catch a midge hatch during like a warm winter day in the middle of the day but um, even during the summer, there will be times when I'm out on the river and there's just nothing happening on the surface. There's no bugs flying around. And so that's when I know, you know, uh, those fish are probably eating nymphs today. Yep. And that that's not even taken into account either that most of a trout's diet is going to be a nymph anyways. That's something that we know. Well, I, I don't know how we know it, but it was, I think some science guy figured it out. And it was probably Bill Nye. No, no, <laughs> no, for crying out loud, it was not him. He, w- he wouldn't know what to do with a I fly I think I rod. watched a video in elementary school about how he determined 90% of a trout's diet was you, underwater. You did not, Alex. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The majority of a trout's diet is underwater. Bill, 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 Bill. <laughs> Oh, the majority of a trout's diet is underwater. So that's one reason why it's so important to know how to nymph. And then like Alex said too, some days they're just not going to eat off the top. So if you want to catch fish, if you want to put fish in the net, you've got to, you've got to know how to nymph. You've got to be able to, uh, you've got to be able to meet the fish where they're at with their food to, you know, get them in the net so you can get a picture and put them back. Yeah. I mean, if, if I had the choice between, uh, big old fish in a dry fly or a big old fish in a nymph, like I'm going to choose the nymph. Really? No. Every time? <laughs> I'm going to choose the dry fly, obviously. It's yeah. a, it's way more exciting. You get to see the fish come up and smack it. Um, so, like, I'm a dry fly optimist, but I'm also a nymphing realist. Okay. That, uh, <laughs> so you're not a purist of any, of any sort? I'm not a purist okay. of any sort, but whatever the fish are taking, that's usually what I'm going to go for. I'm, I'm easy. And I'm a lot more stubborn. I I will tie a dry fly on and kind of force it. And, you know, I I don't catch as many fish as Alex usually. But there's, that's just the way that I want to fish. So kind of what it boils down to. Yep. But uh, now we've got some interesting data that we actually dug up about nymphs, don't we? Yeah. So that that Alex um, can share. Leading up to this podcast, I. When everything we do at VFC, we're, we really try and involve the community and it's not us just sitting over here in our man caves discussing fly fishing philosophy. Really, we like to reach out, understand the struggles that people are actually going through and what problems they're facing and how we can help them. And so both on YouTube, I did a, a community post and then on Instagram, I did a story and we did a poll and I... I asked everybody, I said, what is the hardest part about fly fishing with nymphs? And I gave four options, choosing the right flies, setting up an effective rig. So that's like knots, tippet, fly placement, getting your flies to the right depth or achieving a good presentation, which is like that drag free drift, mending, et cetera. And we got almost 600 people to, to do, to submit an answer, which Mm -hmm. was awesome. We love, love to see that. And what do you think the winner was? So what, what would you have chosen? Choosing the right flies, setting up an effective rig, getting your flies to the right depth, or achieving a good presentation? What's the hardest part about nymphing? Um, I think for me it was probably picking the right flies when I started. Interesting. Why I, would you say that? Because I didn't know anything about nymphs. <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking back to... You're I'm, like, what is this thing? I know. I, I'm thinking back to, you know, those hours on the low pro, and which I'm right next to the lower provo right now, by the way, uh, thinking about that and how I just sat there with my 
butt kicked because I was like, I don't know what nuke to use. You're like, how is this fly supposed to float with a bead on it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so that for me personally, that was the one that I think tripped me up more than anything else. Okay. But what was it? What was the what, what do folks have the biggest struggle with here? So 52 percent of people mm-hmm. said getting your flies to the right depth really was the most difficult part about nymphing. Huh. And yeah, then I didn't expect that. That's interesting. Number two was achieving a good presentation. Okay. And then choosing the right, the right flies and then setting up an effective rig. So it sounds like people, they know how to set it up pretty well. They can choose the right fly the majority of the time. Uh-huh. But they're having a really hard time getting those nymphs to the right depth and then presenting them in a way that a fish is going to hit them. Huh. Interesting. So, so with all of that, data alex you actually went and i I guess you just didn't have anything to do on a friday afternoon one day uh did you You, yeah this is what i do for fun yeah because you're you're the least busy person that i know right (laughs) you you never have anything going on no yeah yeah i got bored so i made a pocket nymphing guide based on all of the data alex put together this pocket nymphing guide and we're giving it out for free you don't even have to give us your email address it is free free like the real free all right it, it there's a link in the podcast description or the show notes wherever you're listening to this and you can just go pick it up and you will be able to go through all this stuff uh and follow along with us but if you're watching the video podcast we'll have some diagrams popping up on the screen here and, and whatnot so we'll be able to follow along with us uh but what we did is we took that data we well i say we Alex took that data, and Alex... We're a team. Yeah, we are, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take credit here, <laughs> all right? Alex put together this nymphing guide, and based on the info that we got from everybody, he came up with two keys for successful nymph fishing. So this is the foundation. Before, before we talk about different rigs, before we talk about a tuck cast, before we talk about the right fly... You've got to understand these keys or you are not going to be a successful nymph angler. And I think a lot of guys that I know don't fully understand these things either. And that's why it's kind of frustrating for them. So the two things are you've got to hit the strike zone. You've got to pick the right fly. Yep. So we're going to, we're going to talk about the strike zone first. So let, let's, uh, let's define it first off. What, what the heck is the the strike zone alex very simple where are those fish hanging out Mm -hmm. that is the strike zone so not not where they're hanging out but where they're eating where they're they're hanging out to eat that's true so if they're if they're just hanging out you know drinking you know whatever (laughs) you know they're not eating my apologies i I should have clarified there where are the fish hanging out and eating there there we go so sometimes if there's a hatch going on, they'll be in the upper water column. They'll be looking towards the surface. They'll be munching mayflies off the water. Yep. Um, but sometimes they're really, really close to the bottom. Yep. Maybe like during the winter when they're all huddled up in a pool trying to keep warm, they're all right down there at the bottom. That's where the strike zone is. And so the strike zone, it's not set in stone. Yep. It can move all over the place. It can. But often we find that the strike zone is lower down in the water column. It's closer to the bottom. Especially when we're fishing nymphs, right? Yeah. So and when, when you get to the river and you're trying to figure out where the strike zone is, you're going to start really by digging into the bottom you're, you're going to go down into the strike zone strike zone first and we're going to talk about how to get in there in a minute but yeah i i the reason they're hanging out at the bottom yep. is it's based off of current right i i love the visual i i don't know where i saw this video one time but it was uh, a stick and it had a ribbon on it mm. and it was like every couple of inches inch inches there was a piece of ribbon yeah and they put the stick down in the water and the ribbon near the top of the water it was flowing it was flapping in the in like a flag in the wind right but the bottom it was basically still yeah and that just shows you that that water is it's rubbing up against the riverbed it's causing friction look at you dropping some bill nye words on us there (laughs) and so that water is slower near the bottom and so that's why the fish hang out there a large majority of the time, a lot of the time. Yeah, and 
because they, they have to spend less energy to hang out there. And trout want to spend the least amount of energy for the most amount of food. And there's also food down there too, yep, right? Exactly. So it's a win-win for them. They spend less energy and they can still eat a bunch. So very often you're going to find the strike zone is going to be in that bottom third of the water column unless there is surface activity. That can be fish rising or that can be bugs hatching because the bugs can be hatching and no fish are rising, but they still might be up higher snacking on the emergers as they're making their way up to the surface. So that is something to keep in mind. But that's why when we talk about the strike zone with nymphing, it's so focused on getting down deep because that's often where the strike zone is going to be. And so key number one of nymphing, hit the strike zone. Yep. And so the the next question is, well, how do we get our nymphs into the strike zone? How do we get those nymphs right in front of the fish? You so just that chuck them out there. Smack it. Yeah, you just throw it out yeah, there, see throw what it happens. Out. Exactly, right? <laughs> you just take your whole box, you just dump it and wait and see. And <laughs> no. Uh, there's a ton of different rigs, actually, uh, that will help you get your flies down into the bottom. I think it's like 1.4 million fly fishing rigs. 1.5, 1. 1. Oh, actually. The, it's up to 1.5 now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Some, some new uh, TikTok <laughs> fly anglers came up with one. So yesterday, la- last night. Uh, yeah, there's there's tons, but regardless of what rig that you decide to fish, and we'll get into rigs in more detail later on in today's show, but regardless of what rig that you're going to go with, the principles are going to be the same thing, no matter what. You are getting your flies into that strike zone as quickly as you can, and you're leaving them there for as long as you can. Yep, and so if you can do that, you're probably going to catch some fish. Yeah. And... Like Spencer said, there's a million different rigs. There's a million different methods. Mm -hmm. But a really good base to go off of for this discussion today is the standard nymph rig. Good old old standard nymph rig. Good old standard nymph rig. So for those of you who are watching the video, we'll put this up on the screen. If you're listening, this is in the pocket nymphing guide. There's a diagram. You have your fly line that goes to your tapered leader, which is usually about the same length of your rod. So nine feet, we'll say we're using our nine foot five weight. Fly flinger. The fly flinger. Mm -hmm. We love the fly flinger. We do. So nine foot leader, that is attached to a piece of tippet Mm -hmm. using a triple surgeon's knot. That piece of tippet is attached to our first nymph. You then take another piece of tippet. You attach that to the bend of the hook of the first nymph. Attach it to the second nymph. So it's a two nymph rig Mm -hmm. and then above that triple surgeon's knot we'll usually add some split shot if we need to get it down deeper and then we also have a strike indicator which we'll put on the leader somewhere depending on also how deep it is and the strike indicator controls our depth the maximum depth that we can reach and it tells us when uh fish has taken the nymphs so it's a dual purpose bobber it is so if you hear us call it a bobber we're, we're we're just doing it to get more comments on the video to to pump this thing up. Yeah, really, really. <laughs> no, because, like, some folks get so uppity about it, and it drives me nuts. Yeah, we we did a tip of the week one time. Yeah. I purposely said bobber. Yeah. And <laughs> it was so funny to read a lot of those comments. Yeah, I know. It's, it's awesome. just so – it is – it's funny. But – so uh, we've talked about our standard nymph rig. Uh, now, how do we get those flies into the strike zone if we're if we're using just a standard nymph rig? How do how do we get them? We know what a strike zone is. We've got our rod rigged up. So how do we get them into that strike zone then? So because of the way we've set up our rig, uh-huh. we have nymphs on there, mm-hmm. and usually nymphs have a bead head. Okay. So they're gonna sink. Some don't, which causes problems, which we can talk about in a little bit. Yep. But. The majority of the time, you're probably going to use like a bigger nymph for that first nymph that has a big bead head on it, and so it's going to sink. And then that second nymph might have a bead head, and it'll also sink. Mm. And so just the way that it's set up like that without any split shot, those nymphs, they're going to sink, and so they could potentially get down into the strike zone. But there are times when you may need to get them deeper. Maybe the current is really fast, and so it's pulling those nymphs, and they don't really have the time to get down into the strike zone. Mm. Or maybe you need to get a little more shallow because the water's really slow, 
and they're just catching up on the bottom and you're catching up, you're snagging up every single time. Yeah. And that indicator's diving under the water and you think it's a fish and it's just moss. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun when that happens, isn't it? Uh, no. No. Fun, fun's, <laughs> fun's not the right word. When you set the hook, oh yeah, that's a fish. And then it's a stick. Or it's a log. Yeah. And it takes your whole rig. And then you got to re-rig and you're just, Spend more time tying knots and you are actually fishing. <laughs> you wonder what in the devil you take this sport up for and you get all grumpy and you come home in a bad mood and then you kick the dog and no, no, you don't. Wow. No. You, you kick your dog? No, I've never kicked Rocky. <laughs> all right. I got a little pappy Even when on. he eats your backpack? Even when he eats my backpack. He ate my favorite fishing backpack the other day. He chewed, not only did he like... He chewed the zippers up on it, so I can't even use it anymore. <laughs> I, it's it's non-functioning anymore. Oh, it's so sad. It, it is really sad. Okay, so to get this back on course after we talk about my wonderful little little puppy there. Uh, <laughs> so we, we've got our standard nymph rig, and one of the great things about it is its versatility in changing where we're at so that we can be in the strike zone, right? Yep, because sometimes we need to be upper water calm sometimes we need to be lower water calm like and and we're not talking like five six feet Mm -hmm. like we're making little micro adjustments like are we six inches from the bottom are we a foot from the bottom are we two feet from the bottom because sometimes those fish they can be pretty picky and if those those flies don't hit them in the nose they're not going to eat them yeah they they get really they get really uppity about it sometimes (laughs) it's kind of frustrating (laughs) But but that's I also that's kind of why I like nymphing. Yeah, is it's problem solving. Yeah, it's oh I added one little split shot and my man day turned into an epic day out there yep. on the water. I went from catching one fish every hour to like twenty in like five minutes. Yeah, it's it's tons <laughs> of fun when it works out like that. So what adjustments then can we make with a nymph rig to make sure that we're getting into the strike zone? Okay, so there's two. So we're too deep. We'll start with that. Um, Our flies are snagging up on the bottom every single time. You can, one, change to smaller, lighter flies. Uh Two, you can remove split shot. And three, you can move that indicator closer to your first nymph. Yep. So that'll that'll help shallow you up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if you aren't deep enough and you need to get deeper, it's just the opposite. You change to bigger, heavier flies, you add split shot, or you move that indicator further from the first nymph. All right. All right. I think I, think I can handle those things. <laughs> so now that we've done that, we know how we can adjust our rig a little bit. How do we know if we're in the strike zone? Where, what, what's telling us that we're, we're there? So it's hard to know a hundred percent unless we grab like a mask and a snorkel and we jump in and, yeah. and we are, we're actually looking at the rig, but sounds like a good video idea. Yeah. Oh, that would be kind of fun. Yeah. 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 I'm going to write that down. Yeah. We might have to do something like that. <laughs> you're, you're jumping in though, right? Oh yeah. I'm wearing my speedo and everything. <laughs> Everybody gets to see it. It's going to be All wonderful. Right, we're, we were not making this video. <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. So four options. Uh-huh. Okay or this is the framework I go, I go through when I'm out there on the river and I need to figure out if I'm in the strike zone or if I need to make adjustments. Okay. Am I catching fish? Mm -hmm. Definitely in the strike zone. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. My nymphs are getting in front of those fish. They're smacking them. I don't need to make any adjustments. Okay. Number two, I'm snagging the bottom every single cast. That's a good indicator that I'm too deep. Uh Um, I'm never snagging the bottom. I'm probably not deep enough. And so this is assuming I'm not catching fish, right? Yeah. And then I'm snagging bottom every once in a while. I'm not catching fish, but every once in a while I'm snagging bottom. I'm probably in the strike zone. Yeah. I, I don't know for sure because I'm not catching fish, but I because it's that lower third of the water calm, I'm pretty confident yep. that I'm in the strike zone. And, and that's the point where you might start thinking about changing flies or other things. We'll get into that later, but that's the point where, you know, you, you might make some more changes there. Yeah. So that, that leads us into key to successful nymphing number two, right? Yeah. Picking the right fly. Because if you're in the strike zone and you're putting your flies in front of fish mm-hmm. and they're not eating them, mm-hmm. it's probably a good sign that you don't have the right flies on. So how do you pick the right fly then? 
magic. Yeah, you just you just do, you just know. Yeah. Like every one every uh, old guy angler that you ever meet <laughs> on the river, they just know, right? They just pull their box out and they're like, Yeah, I think it's this one. <laughs> Tie it on and I can't believe those fish didn't want it. Oh, what's wrong with these Tommy fish that we got here? Now, back in my day, the fish had the self-respect to eat the daggum fly. <laughs> right? That sounds like you. It sounds nothing like me <laughs> at all. Oh, so picking the right fly, it's actually a lot simpler than just magic or just guessing. Uh, really, it, we've got a whole uh, we've got a whole ebook on picking the right flies. We've yeah, got, we do. We've got a lot, and we've got uh, an entire section in the Beginner Fly Fishing Masterclass that's upcoming. It's coming out. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. We spent a lot of time with the bugs. We became one with them. It was uh, <laughs> it was a really enlightening experience, actually, to get down on their level and experience life through a bug's eye. Bzzz. Yeah. It, it really was. You know, we, we thought about calling it a bug's life, but then some other studio was like, you can't call it that. This is trademark <laughs> infringement. <laughs> And I told them to go stuff it, but they've got good lawyers, and so we had to call it something else, <laughs> unfortunately. But, uh, okay, kidding aside, picking the right fly is really simple, and we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty on picking the right fly here because, again, we have a ton of resources for it. The Picking the Right Fly ebook is linked in the podcast description, so you can look at that. Uh, but really, it comes down to looking at the bugs that are in the water. So one way to do that way that I like to do that is pick up some rocks. Yep. Turn them over. You look at what's underneath the rock, and the bugs that are underneath the rock are usually also going to be the bugs that are floating through the water. So if you find these bugs under the rock, yeah, it's you want to try and match those bugs that you see there to something in your box, and then that's what you're going to go ahead and tie on. Yep, so we'll use the right fly formula. Mm -hmm. We'll try to match up a fly in our box to whatever we found on the bottom of yep. the rock. First, we'll match the size, then we'll match the shape, yep. then we'll match the color. And and you want to do it in that order because size is the most important, yep. right? And then shape comes after that and color. I mean, all all of your flies could be fuchsia and you would still probably catch as many, as many trout as I do unless you're on, you know, like the lower Provo where they have to have, it's got to be the rainbow tan orange sow bug today or whatever it is right <laughs> it's yeah. always crazy how how stupid picky some fish can get but usually usually they don't care too much yep. about the color. usually those nymphs are flying by their heads at a thousand miles an hour and they just see something that kind of looks like a bug and they swim over and smack it exactly all righty so we've set the stage now with nymphing a little bit we talked about Getting into the strike zone. We talked about picking the right fly. Those are the basics. That is covering our butts from beginning the to... two keys to success. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what you got to know. But now we're going to kind of push things a little bit. And as a reminder, if you do want to get that pocket nymphic guide, it's available for free. We don't even need your email address, right? No, we're not even asking for your Twitter handle anymore. Maybe the threads handle, because I don't believe that anybody actually uses threads. Uh, I think it's... Just giant conspiracy by Zuckerberg to try and consolidate more power so he can eventually take over the world because he's a little demon. How do you but, really feel about it? You know what? Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this podcast would get censored off all platforms if I said how I really feel, right? <laughs> you can't express opinions anymore in this world for crying out loud. Oh, anyways. Back to nymphing. Yes. <laughs> Back to nymphing. Let's let's get into it. We're gonna this is the section of the show where we are going to push. A little bit. We we talked about that. We're going to give you some basics, but now we're actually going to dive into things and really push the not push the envelope. That's the wrong phrase, but push our comprehension and our understanding so that we can improve our skills. So that's what this section of the show is all going to be about. And we've got kind of a lightning round worth of topics here. Yeah, we in our weekly newsletter email, mm -hmm. um, we this last one, we asked for questions from people about nymphing, mm -hmm. and we got a lot of responses. It was great, a lot of questions. And then we've just been piling up questions from people that submit them to the podcast yep. and DMs on Instagram, TikTok. Just we get questions all the time. Carrier right? pigeons. Yeah, carrier yep. pigeons, smoke signals. Pony Express. Pony it's Express. all been yeah. delivered, yes. All of it. No drones. Yeah. 
Yeah, Spencer shoots those down. I do. So we've got a whole lightning round of just common questions that we hear all the time. And we're going to go, we're going to take a deep dive here. Yeah. So get comfortable again. Go refill your Diet Coke if needs be, because you better not be drinking Coke Zero while you're listening to Untangled. Or while you're recording Untangled. You better not be listening to it <laughs> or drinking it. Oh, all right. Lightning round. Let's start off, Alex. You, you look pretty upset with me. You shouldn't say stuff like that. Oh, I shouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> all right. One of the most common questions we get. What is the difference between each of the nymphing rigs? And, like, how do you set them up? Okay. And how do you set them up? Just so you know, I've been working hard on our masterclass videos, the rigging, knots and rigs and knots. Sec, mo, okay, here we go. Module four is all about rigs and knots. Yep. Uh, you may have seen the last video. We talked about the three knots you need to start fly fishing. Yep. We're going to dive into dry fly rigs, nymph rigs, streamer rigs, into the in the next few videos so if you aren't subscribed to the youtube go subscribe and you'll get those videos in the upcoming week so we're not really going to talk about that but it's more of what is the difference between these nymphing rigs yeah so euro rig uh everybody wants to euro nymph these days apparently they all want to wear skinny waders and have frosted tip hair too <laughs> right is that, that, that what euro nymphers I, I i mean i'm just going off <laughs> european stereotypes they don't want to shave either right <laughs> oh and it, no i'm not uh, to our european listeners i that was all a joke i promise okay i i actually did a transatlantic podcast with uh uh pete tigis over at fly culture a while ago cool so I've got a lot of love for you. I will say they kick our butt in the world championships. So yeah. like it's because it's always in Europe. No, it's not. Okay, but the last one was. Yeah, it was. I yeah. think it was in Slovenia. Slovenia Slovenia. Slovenia. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Do yeah. you need to go back to geography, Alex? <laughs> we we got a new geography teacher this I've year in our high of, school. You can you can come out come on in. We'll learn you up. I've been out of school for a while. Yeah, we, we can tell. <laughs> so Euro rig, no indicator at all. A uh, really long rod, really light rod, uh, really, really thin, light line. And the idea is to make things as thin and light as possible so that it sinks really fast. And you want to have some tension between you and the nymphs so that you can feel the nymphs as they're bouncing along the bottom. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You can actually feel the nymphs hitting the bottom yep. of the river as you they're floating along it's yep. you can feel it in the rod tip it's really cool it is and the idea being that if you eliminate an indicator if you eliminate fly line because you don't even use real fly line you use a really thin fly line and a really like 20 foot long leader if you eliminate that you feel more you get more feedback so you're going to feel more of the takes from the trout so you're going to catch more fish at the end of the day so that's what your euro rig is and, essentially. And the reason the Euro rig is so effective is because those flies cut through the water faster yep. because there's no indicator. So they get into the strike zone faster. And then because it doesn't have the indicator, which can sometimes pull on those flies, yeah. your flies stay in the strike zone longer. Yep. And that's why Euro nymphing is so effective. It key number two to successful nymphing, get in that strike zone faster and longer. Yep, exactly. Now, what about an indicator rig? We talked about that already. We talked about that. I, I would say just one of the cons of an indicator rig is that indicator does pull on those flies. Yep. And so that contact with your flies isn't as direct as it is on a Euro rig. Yep. And so sometimes detecting strikes, the fish might even put your flies in its mouth and your indicator doesn't go down. Like yep. you, don't, you don't even know. And, and so that's... that's yep a problem with the indicator plus rig. you look like a random clown out there with <laughs> balloons floating <laughs> in the water in front of you you know with those little bobbers so uh yeah you know everybody driving by can look you back like, oh he doesn't really know how to fly fish he's just fishing with nymphs so not true <laughs> i use an indic i i'll be honest i use an indicator most of the time um, well yeah you have to for your bounce rig you got to hold all that <laughs> lead up somehow right oh my gosh well speaking of bounce rigs alex why don't you, why don't you tell us about a bounce rig I will tell you about a bouncer. Well, thank so, you. Sometimes, for what I honestly don't understand why the bouncer rig works as well as it does. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes I'll be using a stand because if you look at it, it seems like it would work pretty similar to a standard nymph rig. Yeah, it does. Like you still have the indicator, you still have the split shot, but now 
I'll, I'll put a diagram in the video and I'll even put one in the podcast description for everyone who really wants to learn how to do the bounce rig. You, you, you might need to charge for that. Alex. <laughs> I'll throw a diagram in there, but you basically have it's it's you have your indicator leader. Yep. You do a tag end and you do one fly. Yep. You do another tag end off some tippet, another fly. So you have two flies, and then the bottom is your split shot. And it's for it's like a drop reason, shot rig for bass if you've yeah. ever conventionally fished. Yeah. Yep. And so for whatever reason, that works really well sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Provo River. When I learned the bounce rig, my catch rate went up like 10x. It was the weirdest thing in the whole world. But yeah, it, it just has a lot to do with presentation uh, yeah. and just making it look a lot like what's in the river. And sometimes it works really well. Yeah. Uh, preferences. Oh, no, we got to, we almost forgot the best one here the dry dropper yeah. rig. Okay. Hands down, it is the best. Yeah. I, dry or die, right? <laughs> no, I, this is the way that I fish 90% of the time <laughs> is a dry dropper rig. Uh, I love it because it gives you two options. You're covering two parts of the water column. You're covering the top and then the bottom of that top third and the fish that, uh, are going to come up and eat a dry fly going to come up and eat. And then you can still catch them on the nymph too. That's my favorite way to fish. That's what I enjoy the most. Uh, that that's really the big difference between it and the other nymph rigs. When do you not use a dry dropper? Uh, last night I was learning, I, I've been teaching myself how to spay fish lately. So, uh, I, I don't really think you could spay a dry dropper rig. Yeah, that'd be, I mean, maybe you could, but that's going to be a <laughs> mess. Yeah. Your dry fly just shoots yeah. out there. So, uh, uh yeah, that, that's when I don't. Use okay. It. So let's spay. That's like, <laughs> that's a whole other, that's, that's a whole other animal. class level 900. Um, so if we're talking just like normal day out on the river, when do you not use a dry dropper? If there's a big hatch. Okay. Then I'll have two dry flies on. You'll just go two dry flies? Yeah. Do you ever go nymph rig? I mean, sometimes, but I try not to. So okay. uh, there's one river by my house I kind of have to. Uh, it's a, I've never seen a fish eat a dry fly in the upper portion of this river. Okay. And so I've been nymphing it a lot lately. But even the last, well, let's see, that's a lie, actually, because I had one come up and eat my chubby Chernobyl the other day. Oh, yeah. So. So dry dropper, baby. Yeah. So I'm trying to think, <laughs> like, I fished it with, because I, I was out of Chernobyl's the other day. So I did just throw on, or did I? No. No, I threw, sti- yeah, I, I don't. I It's always a dry dropper, I think, for me. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And we'll throw a diagram yeah. in there for the dry dropper so you can see what that's all about. Um, Spencer prefers it. That's that's my go-to, but I'm a lot... I'll go to a nymph rig faster than Spencer will. Yeah. And apparently, he never goes to a nymph rig, so... I, don't, I honestly don't remember the last time I fished two nymphs <laughs> under a bobber. I, I really don't. Cool. So, yeah, it's just not... I spent so much of my time uh, learning to fly fish staring at bobbers that I really didn't want to keep doing it so oh but th- there's your rig so now let's talk about uh how to tie your tie two nymphs together a tandem nymph rig there's a couple different ways to do it you can either tie a uh off the bend of the hook so you've got your first fly it comes down and then you tie some tippet off the bend of the hook and put it down to your second fly or there are some folks out there who apparently I mean, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with them, but they'll they'll tie it through the eye of the yeah, hook like instead of off the both bend. Both of you'll you'll attach the leader to the first fly through the eye, and then you'll also attach the tippet through the eye to the second fly. To the well, even the first fly. Yeah, yeah. They'll it's like one fly, two clinch knots on the one fly. Yeah, and I I know a guy who used to do that a lot, and I I just don't think the drift is ever going to look quite right so i've tried it yeah I, I read about it and i was like oh that's interesting maybe that will work i hated it man the yeah. the fly just seemed to like super stiff and yep. for whatever I, it just didn't drift right for yeah, me it, it loses a lot of its natural movement so i would shy away from that yeah maybe maybe we're wrong if you fish like that leave us a comment but i i would say that's probably a no-go yeah in my book that, that's that's where i'd be with it too now let's talk about fly position but Hold on. Oh, sorry. Not just the bend of the fly. 
I use tags a lot. Yes, you do. So even in my standard nymph rig, instead of attaching the leader to the eye of the, well, sorry, instead of attaching the leader to the eye and then a t- piece of tippet off the bend of the hook, yep. I'll actually do a triple surgeon's knot, create a tag, and I'll do that first nymph off of the tag. Yeah. I used to not do this, but it seemed to me when I started doing it, that my catch rates went up. I just feel like the fly drifts more buggy in the water. This is just all hypothetical, right? Mm. Like I don't have my snorkel out there. Yeah. But for whatever reason, I really like to use tags when I'm nymphing just because I feel like the, the fly drifts more naturally, but I know you're a bend of the hook guy. Yeah. Cause it's easier and you get fewer tangles. So that's true. It's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. I go that way. Cause (laughs) I, yeah. After guiding for, you know, while I, <laughs> I want to eliminate as many tangles as I possibly can. So, all right, let's talk about fly position. Where do you put these flies? You're rigging up. Where do you put your flies in your rig? How do you know, like, do you put, do you put them in based on size? Like what should be your first fly? What should be your second fly? What do you do there? Okay. If we're talking like standard nymph rig yep. slash bounce rig, I'll usually put the bigger fly as the first fly yep, and the smaller fly as the second, just and keeping the taper going. Exactly. That's why you do it is to keep the taper. Uh, and it, it just, it seems to float better. It seems to drift better, seems to present better, but you want to keep the taper going that way. So that's a common problem. I'll see somebody will have like their zebra midge and they'll have a pat stone fly and the pats will be at the bottom and the, the zebra will be in the middle like if it was a if a dry fly, a zebra midge, and a pats, like mm. that's just that's gonna cast really really poorly. The taper's not gonna quite be there. Uh, it's just not going to drift as well either. You want to do that bigger nymph first, and then the smaller nymph. It's gonna cast a lot better, and it just looks a lot more natural drifting through the water. What if you're using like an emerger pattern though? Uh, if you're using an emerger like what pattern, what if you have that anchor fly and then the point fly? Mm-hmm. So if we're going to like Euro style, wouldn't you want like a hit that heavier fly on the bottom and then that? Well, that that's if we're in a different style of fishing. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's we get, true. We get into point versus anchor flies. So maybe let's let's discuss that for okay. a second. So point versus anchor flies. Um, ain't, it's basically what I was talking about. You have a tag coming off. Mm-hmm. That's your point fly, and then going down to the bottom, that's your anchor fly. Yep. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you like to do? Uh, if I'm if, when I'm Euro nymphing, I've got uh, my big fly is going to be on the bottom, so be my anchor, and then I've got usually a pair to go or something up top. That's kind of my point okay. fly. So you get it like down do. faster. Yep. It hits the bottom, it stays down there, yep. and then you have your lighter fly exactly. in case there's a fish that's maybe riding higher in the water column. Yep, exactly. Makes sense. What about indicators? We got to talk a lot about indicators. Yeah, bobbers. <sighs> Bobbers. So there's a lot of different types of indicators, right? You've got plastic, Mm -hmm. you've got foam, you've got yarn, you've got different sizes. And you've got the best indicator of all, which is just a dry fly. Dry or die. (laughs) That is true. It does have a hook on it. You can catch fish. It really, it's hard to beat. I've had fish hit my strike indicator and I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, you would have caught it if it was a dry fly. If it was a dry fly, what what am I doing? So the the most common one's probably the thingamabobber, right? The yep. plastic plastic looking one. Yep. Uh, and those are really common. There's not really one that I'm going to say is better than any other. I know a lot of folks love the yarn ones, but the problem with the yarn ones is they're they're not as buoyant. Some of them, let me back that up. Some of them aren't as buoyant as others, so they don't work for really heavy nymphs as well as a plastic or a foam one would. Well, and the reason you would want to go to the yarn versus the other ones is it just lands on the water more yep. softly, right? Like if you have that thing in my bobber, this is the one thing that is a problem with strike indicators is they slap the water. Yeah. Like they, it's a big splash. So if it's crystal clear, really slow water, yeah. it hits it and the fish is like, oh, that guy's chucking balloons at me. I'm out of here, right? <laughs> fish ain't going to stick around for that. Yeah. But the yarn lands a lot softer. So you get a much more subtle 
And uh, so maybe there's an argument for the foam landing softer too, but they're not, still not pretty much, big. Yeah. yeah, it's not that there's much. There's still that much more surface area. The yarn ones yeah. have such little surface area yeah. that they land well. Uh, the majority of the time I'm using thingamabobbers. Um, Same here. But I have two different sizes. So I have a bigger one and a smaller one. Yep. One, I think the bigger one's like three-fourths of an inch and the smaller one, I don't remember what it is, but big, small. Yep. And I'll switch to that smaller one when the water is more calm and like I need a, a little bit more subtle presentation. Mm-hmm. But if I need really, really, uh, really, really subtle presentation, I'll just go to the dry dropper. Yep. It's hard, it's hard to beat what even, you get with the even dry dropper. Even if like there's no fish rising or yeah. anything i'll just use the dry fly to use it as an indicator yep. and i'll do a dry double dropper and it's basically a nymph rig i'm yeah. just using the dry fly as a as an indicator exactly see that's why it's that's why it's supreme yeah i mean yeah, yeah. so let's talk about weight then we got to get these flies down right yep so we've got uh, you've got really i mean split shot and putty are really your two options as far as adding extra weight yeah, if you know. don't go with heavier flies, which yeah. I always err towards heavier flies first because the weight, it adds a little bit of a hinge to your tippet. So you're going to, you're not going to feel as many takes. And then there's enough resistance with that weight too, to where the fish, if they open their mouth to eat that fly and it goes in and they feel a little bit of resistance, they'll spit it back out before you can set the hook. That's why you don't use weight in a Euro rig either. Uh, well, that's that's not the only reason. That's one of the reasons why you don't use weight in a Euro rig either. So I, I prefer to just not use split shot unless I absolutely have to. I would to. say another problem with split shot is, I don't know what it is, but it always gets caught up yes, it on does. things more than flies. Yeah. Like it somehow it just gets jammed right in those rocks just perfectly. And yep. then you pull up and it your whole rig just yep. snaps off. And then you're retying again, and then you got to go buy more flies from Ventures Fly Company, and, you know, we take care of you, but, you know. uh, So split shot, there's a couple different options. Uh, A lot of it's still lead, even though lead is, you know, not the best thing to use environmentally. Yeah. Uh, A couple companies make tin split shot and only use tin, so that's, you know, the most environmentally conscious choice is going to be tin. It doesn't sink as well, but... It, it's more environmentally friendly. Exactly. So how many do you add? How do you know, like, how how many split shot do you stick on if you got to get down deep enough? So first of all, split shot is effective. Mm-hmm. It does get your flies down. It does. It does have its cons that we just talked about. Um, but it, it's micro adjustments. Yep. So first things first, if I can use a heavier fly, maybe a tungsten bead, and get them down to where they need to be, that's first resort. Second resort, I'm going to add some split shot. And I, I think you and I actually differ in how we do this. You usually go heavier and then adjust to go up the water column. I usually add a small split shot and keep adding split shot until I get down. Yeah. So there's two different approaches. They both work. Um, I just have found if I add too much right off the bat, I get snagged on the bottom and yep. I lose my whole rig. So. Yeah. I'll start with a little small split shot. And then the four things that we talked about earlier, if I'm catching fish, yep. great. If I'm snagging up. Then you know where you're yeah, at. I, so. I like doing it the way I do just because I like to know where the bottom is right off the yeah. bat so I know how deep I am. And then I just move the indicator or uh, uh, cut the tippet so it's not as deep. It's probably more effective, so, to be honest. I just like going that way. But that's just kind of why I do it. But where do we where do we stick them though in a in a standard nymph rig? Where where do you stick that? Do you stick them in between the flies, ahead of the flies. What do you do? So you can actually do both. Um, I would say the standard practice is you put it about I don't know like six to twelve inches above that first fly. Yep. I'll actually tie a surgeon's knot above that first fly so that the split shot doesn't keep sliding down to that first fly. Yep. That is annoying a lot of the times if you don't have a knot there holding yep. the split shot. In you place. can use a tippet ring yeah, too. Yeah, tippet ring works as, as well, well if you want. Uh, but you could put a split shot. I, <laughs> this is funny. I was actually using a dry dropper the other day, uh-huh. and I threw a split shot on the drop, like just above the dropper, because I just felt I was using an egg pattern for yeah. this time of year. 
I just felt it wasn't getting down. Like I could actually see it like floating three inches below the surface. Yeah. And I was like, that is not getting down. So yeah. I threw a split shot on my dry dropper. So um, basically you can just play around with it and yep, and see what happens. See what happens. So I like for continuity sake and just for casting yeah. ease, I like to put it all above that first fly. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I feel like it casts a little bit better, but that's just my two cents. There, There is no right or wrong. Yeah, the more split shot you add, the harder it's going to be to cast. Yep. It's it's really heavy. It so. is. What about this tungsten putty stuff that we see out there? I've actually never used it. Have you? I've used it once or twice, and I don't really like it. Okay. I What didn't you like about it? I just didn't feel like it stuck to the line very well. I didn't feel like it actually sank. It made a bigger splash than split shot. I've picked it up at, like, Sportsman's before, and it feels heavy. It is. It's just... it's. It just doesn't, like, you, you have to be, re, maybe I did it wrong, but I had to keep reapplying it, and then you had to put, like, a lot on there mm. to get it, and I, it just felt very cumbersome to me. Okay. Um, I, I didn't like the way it splashed in the water. Uh, there was more surface area with it, so it made a bigger splash in the water than a split shot does. So I just, I wasn't a fan. So, and I, I've really, I don't know too many folks who use it very often either. So, I mean, play around with it, but. Uh, I would stick with split shot if if I was just getting into this. Cool. Are there any others? I don't know. I, what? <laughs> Are there any others? <laughs> if there's something else yeah, to do, let us else. know. Yeah, let us know. Sure. That'd be awesome. So how are we going to cast all these yes. bugs? We've got all these nymphs. How are we going to cast them? What's the best cast for nymphing? The Hummer Dinger. The Heimer Dinger. Yeah, Heimer Dinger. Uh, or what about the blind squirrel cast, right? <laughs> yeah, have you seen our casting video in the master class? We had some fun with that. Yeah, that was it was a good time. <laughs> so really you've got two casts. You've got a roll cast or a tuck cast uh, yeah. to to get your flies out. Roll cast are really simple. You really you create what's called the D loop. So you're using some tension of the line that's already on the water. And you literally are just trying to roll the line. You're not picking it up and making an overhand cast. You're just rolling the line uh, in a big loop across the top of the water, and then it plunks back down. Yeah, I would say the roll cast is the way to go because yep. we get a lot of people that are like, I keep getting tangles when I'm nymphing. And it's like the roll cast will help you eliminate tangles. Yep. And we have a video on the roll we do cast. Have, as yeah, well. we'll put it in the description. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing that I like when I'm roll casting, when I'm using like these heavy, bigger nymph rigs is a water load. Yep. I don't know if there's a fancy term for that, but I, I think that is the fancy uh, term. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you basically let the current take your rig out and it straightens everything out. And then it actually will bend the rod if you just hold it behind you and then you just fling it forward. And mm -hmm. I've, I've found that very effective because my rig is already extended out. And so when I fling it forward, it straightens out ahead of me. Yep. And I, when I started doing that a, a long time ago, my tangles went down significantly. Yeah. So it, it, it's a good way to do it. And then what's a tuck cast? So tuck cast is where you get your uh, nymphs to land first. So instead of your line. Because normally when you make a, a nice overhand fly cast, your line rolls out and everything lands on the water. Your fly is the last thing to land. A tuck cast, you just stop your rod tip higher and that will force your nymphs to drop first. Yeah, it kind of like slings those nymphs yep. down to the water a lot faster. So they're hitting with a little bit more speed and there's nothing else dragging them around so they sink quicker. So that's all a tuck cast is. So if you're in a situation where you are making overhand casts with your nymph rig, you're going to want to use a tuck cast to help get you down. Uh, a lot of Euro anglers are going to use that as well. They'll, they'll stop the rod tip a little higher to let everything just hit and drop real quick. So, uh, all righty. I think, I think we're good on those ones, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, another good question that we got in from our email Um how long do you fish until you switch out your nymphs or move to a different spot? So it really kind of depends on where you're fishing. But once you've covered all of the depths and the likely hiding places for trout, it's either time to accept that those fish aren't eating or that you suck and you just can't get them to eat. 
Uh, no, e- either either okay, either think all right the fish aren't eating or maybe something is up with your presentation. That could be fly choice or it could be drag. It could be uh, you're just dr- well yeah drag and fly choice really. I was actually look at yeah I was thinking about this question this morning and I was just like pondering about the summer and all of the fishing trips we've been on. Yeah, and Berkeley's been making fun of me because. He's like, all you ever use is a Frenchie and a zebra midge yep. and a prince nymph. And I'm like, yeah, because this summer, I really just felt like I was focused on presentation. Yep. So, yeah, I was using the same flies, but I was making all of these little micro adjustments. Yep. And I was focused on, like, my casting and the tuck cast and yep. mending and all of those intri- intri- <laughs> intri- intricate details. Wait, 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 intricate details. I can't even talk. And we're on a podcast. This is awesome. Right. So I was really focused on presentation more than fly selection. And I'll be honest, this summer I caught way more fish Mm. and I used less flies. So when to switch out your nymphs, when you've worked all of the water columns and when you feel like you've just perfected the presentation and like, you know, you've gotten flies in front of fish if they're there. Yep. And and that's the other thing you kind of have to just accept sometimes is sometimes the fish just aren't there. And there's this one stretch on a river by my place that it is one of the fishiest looking stretches in the entire river. But I've caught two fish out of that in a year and a half. Since, well, not quite a year and a half since I've been there. Uh, two fish out of there. One was a 23-inch brown trout, <laughs> so it was a really good fish. And then another was I don't know how big it was. I he I didn't quite catch him. I had him hooked and almost to the net. So you caught one fish. Okay. <laughs> one point eight. All right. <laughs> Cause I almost had it into the net. And it, it was it was a substantial fish. I, I think it was a bigger rainbow. Um I don't know how big he was because he wasn't in the net. But those are the only two that I've hooked in that can I can I say it that way? Yeah. Okay. That's allowed. <laughs> those are the only two that I've hooked in that and it's really fishy looking water. So Sometimes that just happens and it's just something you got to deal with. It's unfortunate, but sometimes you just got to, all right, the fish aren't here today because they do tend to move around a little bit more than I think folks realize. Yeah. And I think moving to a different spot, it also depends on the angler. Mm-hmm. Um, like I like to fish faster than most people. I'll, I do too. I'll throw max like 15 casts into a hole probably. And then I'll just move on to the yep. next one. Um, I We'd know, probably catch more fish if we actually work the water. Well, like my my dad, yep. I usually fish ahead of him because I fish faster, and yep. he'll be back there. And I'm like, "What are you doing? You're throwing fifty casts in this hole," and he'll out, he'll catch two, three fish out of the hole that yep. I just fished. Well, and, I mean, that happened last yeah. fall. Me, you, and Berkeley were fishing, and we were out there uh, up by Yellowstone. Remember? And Berkeley was down at the bottom in one of those pools. Yeah. And you and I were just kind of traipsing everywhere in Berkeley State at that one pool, and he was the only one out of the three of us to even get a bite. So, <laughs> you know, and, but it's because he sat there and he worked it. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, persistence will pay off, but, you know, if, if you've done your best, you know, it's okay to just move on to the next spot. So, Agreed. Have you ever hooked two fish on one rig at the same time? Yes, I have. Me too. So it's good times. It's a rodeo when that happens. <laughs> so honest to goodness, trout rodeo. Yep. Um, do you ever just use one nymph? For sight nymphing, yes, I will. If if it's crystal clear and I'm just trying to get a fish to eat, I'll take the indicator off and I'll just throw the nymph out there and watch. Uh, or if it's just one dry and a dropper, then yes, I, that's a. Um, I, I'd consider that just one nymph, right? Uh, but for me, the whole idea of nymphing is to present flies to trout in the best parts of the strike zone. And to me, that means I need two nymphs if I'm going to do it effectively. So I just try, I, I try to always have two nymphs on. I really only go to that one if it's obvious that there's only one fly they really want. Uh, or if it's a really big, heavy nymph. Uh, I've been fishing a lot of crawdad patterns for the last couple months because the rivers by my place have a ton of crawdads in them, and that's all the fish want. So I've been fishing a lot of crawdad patterns, and they're big and they're heavy. 
So I'm throwing them out there. I'm letting them drift. And I'm just throwing one under a dry fly at this point, under a big chubby. And because any more than that, it's just kind of a complete circus trying to cast that stuff and mend it all. So I'm just focusing on the one uh, right now. Cool. Awesome. Having a difficult time setting the hook. So I know folks have a hard time setting the hook sometimes. And really, hold the line tight against the cork, (laughs) all right? (laughs) I can't tell you how many times I see people out there trying to set the hook and they're just lifting up on the rod and they've got slack line out there like they're trying to (laughs) beach the Titanic or pull it in. I don't know. Just hold the line tight against the cork. How many times do we talk about that, Alex? (laughs) How many times do we go over how important it is to hold the line tight? Hopefully this is our last. Hopefully, (laughs) right? Because uh, seriously, and I'm not, I'm not like, I just (laughs) wish folks would, you, you have to have tension when you set the hook. So if you set the hook and there's no tension, you're not going to drive that hook point home. If you've got a really long drift out there and you just limp wrist that hook set, it's not going to work. I remember one time we were out, it was me, Alex, and Berkeley. We were all floating in my boat. And I forget if it was Alex or Berkeley, but one of them was making a really limp-wristed hook set. And I kind of got after one of you guys. I think it was me. I, I it probably was. <laughs> and I kind of, I was like, dude, because you missed a really big fish. Yeah. And I was like, you, you've got to actually set that hook. So especially if you've got 40, 50, 60 feet of line out on a nymph drift, which is not uncommon, you've got to actually really set that hook. Not like you're in the Bassmaster Classic or anything like that, (laughs) but you hold the line tight, you lift up firmly and quickly, but you're not snapping anything. You're just... Well, and I think that's why I was so limp-wristed that day is because um, I think a couple weeks before that, you were critiquing my hook sets. I was not. (laughs) And I was flicking my wrist and like I I was was essentially pulling way too hard. Yep. And so... It's it's all about finding that balance of not pulling too hard, but pulling hard enough. Yep. And that just comes with time. And I mean, if you hook into the fish and you catch it, that's the best indicator that you're doing it correctly. Yep, exactly. So you'll figure it out eventually and you, you'll get the timing down. I mean, I always, if you're nymphing, you want to set with the current, right? So because you're you're using the current to help drive the hook point home. So you want to set with the current. Uh, or downstream, uh, a downstream hook set uh, is going to help you uh, get the most, I think, out of your hook sets. Yeah, if that fish is facing upstream and you pull upstream with your hook set, that hook will come out of the fish's mouth. Yep. You got to set downstream. Yep. Use the current to your advantage. Yes. All right. I, I do have a question for you, though. What's that? Are hook sets free? I hear that all the time. Well, what like, do you mean? When in doubt, set the hook. I mean, I set the hook a lot on stuff, but only if it's, like, really fishy. Maybe I don't know. What, what do you think? I feel like when you're a beginner, yes. But as you start getting more and more into nymphing and fly fishing and you, you understand exactly what a fish take looks like, sometimes, yes, you set the hook and you're like, oh, I thought that was bottom and it was a fish. Mm. But there have been a lot of times when I go to set the hook mm. and that motion, that indicator coming off the water or those flies whipping out of the water, it actually spooks the fish. Mm. And so, it, it again, it's finding that balance between yeah. setting the hook every single time you see your indicator twitch versus like, okay, I actually know this is a fish. Yeah. And right. yeah, it's my hot take okay. for today. <laughs> It's kind of lukewarm take at best. Yeah. You got to start, you got to, you got to holler a little bit, I mean, bit, we Alex. can't all just yell at people. Hey, I'm not yelling at people. I'm yelling at the general population, right? <laughs> oh, all right. Hey, this is our last one, man. All right. What's the best fly rod for nymphing? You tell me. You're the guy with 32 fly rods. 46, all uh, right? <laughs> well, it's gone up quite a bit since the last time we talked. Well, yeah, I got two new spay rods, so... <laughs> Oh, it's a, you know, I'm always like, I'm always hitting Alex up for uh, wing money. And, you know, it's like, why? <laughs> well, it's because I, I had to buy two new spay rods, right? Oh, speaking of, we're getting wings after this, right? Probably. 
Probably. <laughs> it's a yes or no question. Depends how good this podcast turns oh my, out. Crying out loud. Oh, best fly rod for nymphing, nine foot five weight. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that's a really good one. Yeah. Um, does, really, does everything. Yeah. And, and that's, that's if you're doing your standard nymph rigs. It'll do everything except Euro nymphing. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, you could do. You could do Euro nymphing on it. But you're not going to get the same benefits. You're not going to get as many benefits out of the Euro rig with a nine foot five weight as you would from a Euro rod that's specifically designed for it. Yeah. Because you lose a lot of that sensitivity. I, I don't think you'd feel the flies yeah. bouncing on the bottom exactly. if you were using a five weight. You might feel a little bit, but. Yeah. Yeah. A 10 foot five weight's great for nymphing as well. Yeah, a little more reach. Yep. Uh, an 11 footer, I mean, at that point, that's a Euro rod. Yeah. So that'd be great. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of even nine, nine and a half foot rods, uh, that a lot of folks are making lately for this exact reason. Cause they're just a little bit more versatile. So, uh, shoot, man, that's a lot of info that we just covered. Yeah, I'm tired. I need a nap. <laughs> Tell you what, <laughs> I, I need a nap, but hopefully to all you listening, hopefully you listened all the way to the end first off. And if you did, thank you. Uh, but we really appreciate it. Hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully you found this to be a beneficial use of your time. And if you've got any more questions about nymphing, if there's something that we missed, something we didn't get to, then you need to let us know. Drop us a comment. Uh, let us know. We will get to that if we possibly can. And if you could, please take a second to rate and subscribe to the show, wherever you're listening to it. That helps us out a ton more than you know. And... I I mean, are are you good to say goodbye, Alex? Let's do it. All right. Until next week, everybody, get out on the water and tie lines.